Hello everyone, my name is Linda Thompson and I am absolutely delighted to join the webinar today on the experience or the experiences of prostitution. Um, I work for the Women's Support Project. I'm a national coordinator on commercial sexual exploitation. I get funded by the Scottish Government to develop and deliver programmes of work to raise awareness of the harms and the realities of commercial sexual exploitation as a form of violence against women. And I think the event today um, is really timely um, to look at the lived experience and the realities of women in the sex industry. And what I hope to cover today in my very short 20 minutes is a little bit about the Scottish context, about commercial sexual exploitation and violence against women and the links between it, to cover some of the realities that we have heard from Scotland about women's experiences and then to propose some of the ways ahead. I have to say thank you to the Nordic Model now for organising the event and also to all of the other speakers. I hope it provides a really rich um, session that really brings women's voices to the fore. And in order to work with that, um, I'd like to share with you a quote from a woman, Wendy, who was involved in a piece of work that I developed called Inside Outside. And Wendy talks about that experience of trying to articulate and to tell others about what was happening to her while she was involved in prostitution, but for her, People really didn't want to know. They didn't want to know about the harms. It made them too uncomfortable to actually listen to that. And for her, that silencing is like a gag. And I think that is incredibly important that we have to allow women the space, the time and the respect um, to articulate what has happened to them. And through that, that is how we will all learn and how we will learn and also to become to come up with basically the way ahead to um, eradicate uh, the system of prostitution. Now, I'm normally used to delivering public education to rooms full of people. Um, it's been a little bit different sitting here on a webinar today, um, speaking to a camera in my quiet, lonely office. But very often whenever I deliver public education, people feel of me as some kind of storm crow who comes into the room. Um, and, you know, very often I attend meetings about other forms of violence against women and then I'll go, oh, but what about women in prostitution? And you can sense the atmosphere change because people are uncomfortable with having to um, confront and be confronted by the reality of prostitution. And I fully acknowledge that um, for a lot of people, it is a prickly, it is a thorny issue. It is an incredibly contested issue and it is a toxic environment. But we have to remove the toxicity in order to make it a safer space for women to speak out about their own experiences. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the Scottish um, strategic context, um, because I think for us in Scotland, very often people look at us and they go, you have kind of got it sorted up there. Um, you know, globally, Scotland has been thought of as incredibly progressive about gender based violence and violence against women. Um, and enacted some quite, quite far-reaching and progressive interventions, including our legislative model. Um, you know, we were one of the first countries that had specific domestic abuse courts, which really focused on the perpetrators and focused the attention of the criminal justice system, really, um, onto those perpetrators, that they didn't get lost in the system in some ways. And that was about holding those, shining a spotlight on those perpetrators and holding them accountable. We also, you know, have recently introduced the what's called the Course of Control Act, but really that is um, a new legislation to capture different forms of violence against women. Um, and there's a recognition that violence is not just physical and it is not just sexual violence, that actually there can be much more subtle dynamics at play around coercion and control. So again, in Scotland, we decided to legislate on what is a really difficult thing to legislate on, but we decided that we wanted to move forward with that legislative model to hold perpetrators accountable. And we also introduced the um, Misuse of Sexual Images Act, which some people call revenge pornography, but the Misuse of Images Act, which is based on predicate, based really on women's consent and women's consenting for their images to be shared. But it bases us consent. And again, we legislated on men who eroded and overrided um, women's notions of consent. So I think in Scotland, we decided that legislation was a tool and one a very important tool to hold perpetrators accountable. So with that in mind, how did we get to this stage? 
Well, we allowed survivors to name the violence and we allowed them to talk about their experiences and also we believed them and what they said. So it was no longer the dismissive, oh, well, she chose to get into that relationship. Well, you know, if it was so bad, she could leave. Oh, well, she must be getting something out of it. Or oh, at least she gets a room over her head. That is not the direction that we took. We wanted survivors to name and define the violence. And whenever they did, then that allowed us to make those links between different forms of violence, but also to make the links back out into our culture and our society. We decided to focus on the perpetrator and to use our legislation in that way. Um, it was a, it took a long time. It was over 30 years. There's still a huge amount of work to be done. However, there was some very brave and courageous conversations that took place around how did we move our understanding forward. And surely now is the time that we apply that same process and that same thinking and that same rigor around holding perpetrators accountable to this particular form of violence against women, to commercial sexual exploitation and prostitution. We do have a national strategy, Equally Safe, which aims to prevent and eradicate all forms of violence against women. And we name commercial sexual exploitation and prostitution as one form. So in Scotland, we have decided that we needed to focus attention on preventing it ever happening in the first place. And we also need to support women while they're involved in any form of violence against women, but we need to support them to leave. But ultimately it's because we've decided that we want to eradicate all forms of violence against women. So there's a zero tolerance for any form of violence against women in Scotland. So we've got a combined approach, which is about preventing it happening in the first place and eradicating it. Now, if we want to prevent violence against women, we have to look at the whole jigsaw puzzle around what causes violence against women. And we know it is a complex social and economic phenomenon, a cultural phenomenon. But if it is a cultural phenomenon, it is not inevitable. It is not part of human nature. And therefore we can move to eradicate it. But in order to do that, we really start, we really have to look at the causal story behind violence against women. And also I would suggest that we have to consider commercial sexual exploitation within that. Because if we fail to do that, we are not seeing the full picture. If we accept that violence against women is rooted in gender inequality, then we must look to how we remove barriers to women's gender inequality, their economic, political and social equality. And therefore, gender inequality must be one of our driving motivations. Now, if we talk about gender inequality and gender equality, we have to look at the attitudes and values that exist in our culture and men's beliefs that set them at a higher level that basically creates and perpetrates and condones gender inequality. And we know that in our culture, um, men have beliefs that they're entitled to sexual access to women, that they're somehow superior to women and that they're entitled to be aggressors. So we have to look at where do these beliefs beliefs come from, what builds these beliefs, what reinforces these beliefs, and what accepts these beliefs. And I believe this is where it is crucial that we address the sex industry and prostitution. Because in our popular culture, there are the same messages about gender that underpin the dynamics of violence and abuse. I mean, many of you will probably be very familiar with the work that Liz Kelly and more latterly and with Maddie Coy on this particular issue. And they're very clear on making that links behind, between the role in a way of the existence of prostitution and the acceptance of prostitution in creating a conducive culture with these negative um, reductive messages about women and women's role. And we know that in order to enact acts of violence against any particular group, um, it is much easier to do that when you have dehumanized and objectified them. And again, I think if we think about the sex industry, it is based on the idea that women as a class are made in a thing, as a thing for others to use, other sexual use, primarily men. So we have to question the role of the sex industry. And if we look at the principles, and one of the principles are the principles from CEDAW, the Convention to End the Discrimination Against Women, we must eradicate the stereotypes, prejudices, customs and practices which condone or promote gender-based violence. And I think we only have to unpick the sex industry and the experiences within women um, who are involved within it to see how it basically promotes negative stereotypes, negative customs and practices, and condones and promotes gender-based violence. Kofi Annan, the UN um, 
Secretary General in 2003 clearly indicated that sexual exploitation is based on an abuse of vulnerability and an abuse of power. Now, if we think about the concept of power, what gives someone power over another or what gives a group power over another? In Scotland, we have a really quite robust definition around child sexual exploitation, which locates the abuse of power at the heart of it. And we spend a great deal of time on picking and looking at this concept of power and what gives one person or one group power over another. Um, and just in a kind of summary around that, it, we find that it was an age. So if somebody is older than someone, that gives it, they're in a position of power. Um, men are in a more powerful position as a class than women. Also, if you have access and a background where you've been able to unveil of education and intellect and thinking, that also potentially puts you in a more powerful position, as does your access to resources, whether or not that is money, drugs, alcohol, accommodation, safety, protection. But if you have access to those resources and you have them, then you're in a more powerful position than others. And also where your status and your social standing and your influence in your culture and your community. And if we think about that, you know, about the stigmatization, the judgment that is put on, on women who are involved in the sex industry, um, clearly they are put in a less powerful position in, in overall. That is not to say that there's not individuals who may feel incredibly powerful within the system of prostitution, but as a broad sense, we acknowledge that power is more often given to men. And in the context of sexual exploitation, it is the person who is buying, exchanging, or has access to resources, who is in a much more powerful position than the person who needs access to all of those. So we have to question the foundations of power that run through the sex industry. And the growth of the sex industry really over the past 20 years has served to promote a very skewed idea of sexuality where women are framed as objects. So we have to question the role of the sex industry in creating and per uh, um, per perpetuating some of those attitudes and beliefs that um, reinforce the power dynamics. And I think we have to ask, does the sex industry promote gender equality? Does it challenge gender inequality? Or does it address any issues of gender stereotypes? And if we say no to those, that it doesn't promote gender equality, that it doesn't challenge gender inequality, and it does um, promote gender stereotypes, then we have to think, what is, it, uh, what is its role in creating the conducive culture for other forms of violence against women? And if you look at this simple diagram, it basically says, unless we address and challenge the foundations of violence, then we will never move forward to address all other forms of violence against women. And I would suggest that commercial sexual exploitation is very clearly placed in with objectification of women around sexism, about traditional roles, about narrow, rigid gender stereotypes of women, around sexual harassment. And if you think about the experiences of women within the system of prostitution, they will experience all of these in and of themselves, but also the system of prostitution creates that foundation and basis, and it perpetrates the attitudes and beliefs that place men as sexual aggressors and as entitled to women's bodies. Now, if we think about the experiences of women in prostitution, we know it's a contested area. And we know that there's many resources invested in certain groups and lobbying groups to put forward um, ideas around it. And in Scotland in 2015, Jean Urquhart, an MSP at that time, um, she proposed uh, re reforming the legislation, the Prostitution Reform Act. And it was a very clear um, rhetoric within that, that we should only let people who currently sell sex lead the conversation. Now, I think that's an interesting concept. And if we think back to what I said earlier about survivors being able to name the violence, um, it is incredibly important that women who are currently involved are able to talk about their experiences. But we must also listen to women who have left that particular form of violence, because as we know, whenever a woman leaves a, a, a position or a situation of abuse, and whenever she's in a safer place or in a space and time away from that, she's able to reflect back and have a much different understanding around her own experience. But there's also this idea that it's only those who currently sell also means that no one else is allowed to say. Now, I think if we talk, if we think about domestic abuse, did we, do we really suggest that, um, 
just because we may not directly experience domestic abuse, that we are not allowed to talk about it, that we're not allowed to lead conversations, that we're not be able to be involved in conversations, because I think that's a silencing tool. If we think about domestic abuse as having broader cultural impacts, then we critique it. If we can accept the prostitution, the system of prostitution has broader cultural impacts, and then we must critique it. But in Scotland, via the Encompass Network, we decided, yes, let's look and let's talk with and engage with women who are currently um, involved in selling sex. I do think it's important to note, as in gender, one of the leading um, feminist gender equality organisations in Scotland has highlighted, that whenever you critique a system, it is not about critiquing each individual woman within it. And it is not about denying that they have agency. It is not about denying their skills, resources, qualities that they have. But it is basically saying that we can accept that women will have agency and make choices within different situations. However, we must take a step back and we must look at the broader gender structures that underpin really the sex industry and the impact it has on the wider population. So with that in mind, I think it is important that we look and we frame our discussions around choice and women's choice and individuals' choice within the broader context of choice in our society and a choice in our society that is an unequal society. So to keep true to the idea of listening to the experiences of women involved in prostitution via the Encompass Network, I undertook a piece of work called Inside Outside, which is a storytelling project involving women um, in all different elements of the sex industry in Scotland and then allowing them to tell their story and the story of their experiences. So with the 16 women overall that I was involved in, um, not all of them saw the whole way through, but I mean, I'd like to give a moment of thanks to the women, Cassie, Kiri, Stephanie, Sarah, Natasha, Natalia, Levi, Kiri, Wendy, Sarah, Jane and Joanne. They are an incredible group of women. I was incredibly privileged to work with them. Some of the most um, funny, resourceful, skilled, powerful, strong women who led really complex lives. And I, I mean, I just like to give thanks to them for allowing us the privilege to hear their stories, because through hearing their stories and listening to some of what they say, I think they clearly articulate the notions of choice, consent and control that existed or didn't exist for them within the sex industry. We turned their stories into a book and we also allowed women the opportunity to take part in a creative project to find different ways to illustrate really their experiences within prostitution. And I'd like to start with Levi. Um, Levi took this image and she entitled it The Crumbling Underneath because it really for her summed up this idea that she put a brave face on it, a painted face on it while she was involved in prostitution and whenever people asked her how was she doing or what was it like for her she was like it's fine, it's good and then people accepted that but they didn't realize what was going under on underneath that she was far from fine and she was crumbling and this image was um Basically, from all of the women involved in the project, this is what they selected as the kind of signature image for this particular project, because for all of them, it felt up, uh, they felt it summed up that experience about putting a mask on. I'm fine. I've chosen it. It's great. But that was not their reality underneath. If you look at also the notion of um, choice, consent and control, Wendy, who was involved, who you heard from earlier, she took this other image um, of a young woman to symbolize a young woman who she saw um, with a punter. And she said that this young woman was dead behind the eyes, that she had given up. And again, the women and a lot of the women talked about their experience inside prostitution basically had taken so much away from them. Natasha, a woman who was trafficked into Scotland, she talked about um, her experiences. And this is the amount of sex that she had to have in a week with punters. And she talked clearly that that was not her choice. She wasn't able to choose who she had sex with or when she had sex with them. They would just turn up, um, being arranged by um, her pimp or her traffickers, um, and she had to be available 24 hours a day. She also talked that she had to be drunk every single day that she had to get tipsy and drink a bottle of vodka, otherwise she couldn't go into that room with a punter. So again, around our notions of consent, a lot of the women talk about having to use drink and drugs to get through. And in our work around consent and public education around consent, um, we question the ability of women and men, but to fully consent to sex whenever you're under the influence of drink and drugs. But for a lot of women, that was their day and daily. 
Natalia, who was involved in street prostitution, talked about the need to wear a weapon or carry a weapon because of the threat of violence. And she also clearly says that she was not prepared for that life at all. She was not able to make an informed choice to get on um, and get involved in it. She was not aware of what was going to happen to her. And Wendy, again, she also talks about that threat of violence. And if you're having sex under a threat of violence, I think we need to question your ability to fully consent to it. Natalia again talked about the concept of money and money buying consent. And she talked that actually in reality, the punters might as well just have given that money directly to the hands of the dealers because it never stayed with her. Levi talked about men pushing boundaries and pushing boundaries and refusing to say no. She also talked about the disassociation that she experienced and also talked about that experience of drugs. She was off her head with speed the first time she saw a punter and was unable and is now unable to remember anything other than her boots that she wore at that time. So again, the notions of choice, consent and control. She talked about the dehumanization, the objectification. All she was, was a plaything, a party toy for the punters. And she talks about that link for her around um, the use of drugs to deaden the experience in order for her to cope what was happening to her. She also told me that heroin made her quiet. And if she was quiet, she was less likely to get a punch in the face from a punter. So again, the questions of consent, choice and control are clearly shown for Levi not to be in existence for each and every time that she had to see a punter. She talked about those boundaries being pushed and pushed and pushed and men refusing to take an answer and to refusing to hear no. Cassie, a trans woman who worked in saunas, again, she talks about the idea of choice. It's almost there and you're told that you've got choice, but not really. You don't really have choice. You feel obliged to have to see each and every client that comes in. Katie, also involved in the saunas in Edinburgh, she took this picture and she entitled it, Step Into the Unknown, because she didn't know what she was getting involved in. And she also used drink and drugs, because that's how you cope. And when that wasn't there, that blow came. The buffer isn't there of drink and drugs. Then the reality of her experience hit her. Sarah Jane talks also about punters pushing boundaries, pushing boundaries, pushing boundaries being in the more powerful position against vulnerable women who are no longer able to control what is happening to their bodies whenever they're with a, a client or a customer or a punter. Cassie talks about the need to split off and that need not to be fully present. And if you're not fully present, are you able to give authentic consent? She talks about those two characters. And Joanne, who was involved, she said that men didn't buy her consent men think they're buying your sounds. And she done a piece of work with us with a Glaswegian artist, Kathy Weir. And through these pieces of art, Joanne's story, she clearly shows that dehumanization and that experience that happened to her, that every time it actually had an impact, it wasn't just the violent men, that actually by the end of it, it had taken everything away, your everything had gone, and you were left as a blank mask. She talks about the dehumanization that actually for punters, it wouldn't really matter that you're not a human being, you're really, you're just a thing. She talks about the men, and I asked her to tell me about something good that happened in street prostitution, and she talked about one incident. And actually the one incident she talked about was just an absence of violence. And she talked about punters, but she talked about their choice as a contrast to the women's choice. That for her, she'd never met a girl or a woman who had had a choice, but the punters had a choice. So I think whenever you listen to those women's voices, they clearly show through their experiences that choice, consent, control, power, all of that is, was not always present for them. So if we think about the system of prostitution, then we have to start questioning why is it that we allow this to continue to happen? Now, I do work with the Encompass Network that brings together the frontline services across Scotland and through COVID, we have been lucky enough to secure a small amount of money from the Scottish Government for a crisis fund for women. And women have been come forward and applying, women involved in all aspects of the sex industry. And they're absolutely desperate for money. COVID has shown the fault lines. These women are existing in a situation of poverty before COVID hit. And now COVID has clearly highlighted how vulnerable and precarious they are in situations that they are in. Women have needed money for basic living essentials, for food, for them and for their families. 
they need money, primarily a lot of them for housing in order to keep a roof over their head, their basic human right. They need money for heating and lighting. And for a lot of them, they needed money for their kids and for the basics. And I think that in itself shows you that prostitution did not solve the problem of poverty for the women. In fact, for a lot of them, it merely compounded it. And where we are now, as we move through and onwards, supposedly through the root map, out of lockdown. We're now facing um, a situation of going back into lockdown. And I think it shows that because the women have been put on a back burner and because the women and this form of violence has not really been treated in a consistent way with others, these women have been left behind. And with that idea that um, if you are faced as this particular um, artist, it calls it sex work, but really if, you, if it's a choice between that and poverty, is it really a choice? And Rachel Moran, who many of you will know, um, be very familiar with, you know, Rachel really talks about that assumption choice leads to the idea of consent. So if a woman chooses to be involved in prostitution, she has consented to everything. However, because of broader circumstances, you know, there is a difference between consent and reluct submit, reluctant submission. Women very often exist in situations and contexts beyond their own control and that their entry into and their experience within prostitution is linked to poverty, discrimination and disadvantage. So with that in mind, I think the only thing that we can look at is how we remove that system of prostitution, but ensure that there is safety nets in place for the women um, and that we need to decriminalize the sale of sex and make sure that they have access to all the safety, protection, healthcare and support and exit and routes that they need. And just because a woman wasn't physically forced does not mean that there weren't other forces that were pushing her towards that. And I think this for me sums it up. The argument against the system of prostitution is pretty simple. Women should not have to have sex with men they don't desire. They should be able to thrive and not just survive for them and their families. They should be able to do it without accommodating men's desires and abuse in order to, to live. We need to change attitudes and we have to challenge attitudes and we need to eradicate misogyny and entitlement that fuels this form of violence. And we will never move forward towards equality while one sex is for sale and while one sex is able to buy another. Women's rights to safety must always be greater the men's rights to buy. And having to have sexual activity and been paid for it due to desperation is not consent. And anybody that uses a vulnerable or poor woman for intimate gratification needs to be held accountable. And we cannot move forward with gender equality whilst we say that there's a group or a class of women for whom it is fine to be used and abused and violence to be enacted against them. So what do we do about this? Well, that question was posed to our for, former justice minister in Scotland, um, Kenny McCaskill, and he said, mm, well, what's to be done? Maybe sometimes looking the other way is the best. Laws cannot always provide answers to deep-rooted social problems. And whilst laws cannot provide the answer, laws can create a normative culture, can send out a clear signal as to what we consider to be acceptable in our society. And I don't think it's acceptable, the idea that all we have to do is turn a blind eye. As Audrey Morrissey said, we cannot do that. We need to fight for the vulnerable. We need to fight for vulnerable children, vulnerable young people, and vulnerable adults who are drawn into this industry because of poverty, discrimination, and inequality. And in Scotland last year, the Scottish Government launched its programme for government. And in it, they said that they were committed to exploring what more needs to be done. And part of that was to consult on approaches to challenge demand. And currently in Scotland, the consultation has just opened. It's on until the early in December, a consultation um, for the Scottish Government about the way ahead. But we would propose that any model that is developed needs to place at its absolute heart women who are more vulnerable and have little alternatives. And it's only right that that's where we focus our attention. I accept that there's women who say that they um, enjoy what they do, that they feel empowered by what they do, that they feel it's a form of work. But actually, I think our public policy needs to be driven by meeting the needs and supporting the needs of the most vulnerable and ensuring that they can't and won't be placed into a situation of vulnerability, which can be exploited by others. So we proposed a seven element model for Scotland 
to prevent and eradicate prostitution. And we put it out there because we felt it was about time that these courageous conversations took place. You know, I'm in this job for 12 years now, and I still hear the same conversations about the challenges of engaging around the system of prostitution and how contentious it is and how difficult it is and how toxic it is. And you know what, whilst that vacuum of discussion and policy decisions have been, or has been in existence, women have been put in a back burner and they have been ill served. So we would suggest the seven elements are in really embedding this in early education and primary prevention work around healthy relationships and sexuality and consent. We believe that we need increased public education around the harms and the realities of prostitution and as a form of gender-based violence, that we need to work with universal and mainstream services to capacity build to ensure that they can better meet the needs of those and the women who are involved. But additional to that, we do need specialist services. We need support services and harm reduction services that really work with women um, while they're involved and ensure that we work closely alongside of them. But ultimately, we also need exit models, comprehensive, well-resourced, well-invested exit models that are trauma-informed. And in fact, at the moment, via the Encompass Fund, a great number of the women who are applying for that have said, now's my time to get out. But what are they getting out to? So we have to have a robust model there. We also have to remove barriers for women around employment and moving forward. We need to decriminalize the sale of sex. If we feel that women are victims of this particular form of violence against women, why are we continuing to decriminalize them and leave them with criminal records? And ultimately we have to look at those who benefit and who profit from this system of prostitution, who have full choice. Those that choose to exploit the economic and the, and the social vulnerability of women. And that has to be those who advertise, who profit from, who market um, women in prostitution. But we also have to look to holding perpetrators accountable. And under outcome four, in Equally Safe, this is in Scotland where we believe now is the time that we have to move forward with this, to hold perpetrators accountable. And I'd just like to leave you with a couple of quotes. This is from Sally, one of our really highly experienced and highly skilled worker in Scotland. And she basically said, if prostitution is not good enough for your daughter or my daughter, well, whose daughter is it good enough for? And I think that's a fundamental question because if you accept a system of prostitution um, and you accept that it's going to exist, then you're also going to accept that there has to be a group or a class of women in which this is acceptable for. And we, I won't accept that. And I won't accept that as a vision for those individual women, but for women across the board, nor for my country and not for where we want to frame ourselves. And if we want in Scotland to frame ourselves as a society that is based on equality and fairness, and our vision for that, then prostitution can't exist. And it is not acceptable to buy women for prostitution, not if we care about each other and not if we care about our society. And I think this is the time, surely in 2020, we have been through a global pandemic and we are still experiencing it. And that pandemic is pushing more and more women towards the system of prostitution. So this surely has to be the time in which we decide that we are going to eradicate prostitution and move to prevent it. And surely the only way that we can realistically do that is if we decide, <clears throat> excuse me, is if we decide that prostitution is no longer acceptable in our society and in our culture. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a really enjoyable um, rest of an afternoon. I'm sure that it is going to be <clears throat> incredibly interesting, incredibly stimulating, and also incredibly um, challenging as we listen to the voices of the survivors with Rebecca, with Alice, but if we also listen to what has happened to women in other um, kind of approaches, such as the hold back model. So thank you very much to the Nordic model for today. And thank you very much for all of you for giving me your time.